Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. So good evening, everyone. I'm Michaela Hall, director of the library. I want to thank you all uh, for coming today. And I want to give special thanks to Mark Zimmer and Pam Leeming uh, from our program committee for all of the work they have put into the event tonight. And also to Carla Umlin, our assistant director, and the rest of the staff uh, for their support in organizing the event. Again, as I've already said, we just ask all participants to keep cameras and microphones off unless asked by myself to turn them on. This will ensure there is no interference during the presentation. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat and they will be answered when we're ready to open up uh, the Q&A portion of the program. I am recording and all personal information such as names of participants will be removed before it is uploaded to our YouTube channel. I will now turn it over to Pam Leeming and Pam will both introduce Mark and also ask him all the questions that are the basis of the program tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michaela. Welcome, everyone. I am Pam Leeming, a member of the library's program committee, as Michaela said. And tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Mark Zimmer, who will be speaking about the current state of science, which is also the title of his latest book. Mark is the Jean C. Temple, class of 65, professor of chemistry at Connecticut College, where he's been on the faculty since 1990. He teaches general chemistry, molecular science, and environmental chemistry. Along the way, Mark has acquired an impressive slew of honors and awards, he was named the Connecticut Professor of the Year in 2007 by the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education and the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. In 2001, Mark received Connecticut College's John S. King Memorial Award that recognized his excellence in teaching. And in 2005, he received the Nancy Batten Nisbet Rash Faculty Research Award for his outstanding scholarly achievement. Professor Zimmer was also the program chair for the Inorganic Division of the American Chemical Society for four years. And he won the John S. Burlew Connecticut Valley Section Award in recognition of his outstanding contributions to chemistry. Now, for all of Professor Zimmer's degrees and his academic achievements, I can promise you, you will not fall asleep during the next hour. On the contrary, Mark is recognized for making his work, whether he's teaching or speaking or writing, relevant and interesting to professionals as well as to a general audience. Mark's book, uh, The State of Science, this is six, and it is available at Bank Square Books in Mystic or through the Savoy Bookshop in Westerly. It is a broad discussion of the scientific enterprise, past, present, and future, the good science and the bad science. It's about, it talks about the women and men who do the research that has led to major scientific discoveries, such as mapping the human genome, optogenetics, deep learning, measuring gravitational waves, which have changed the way science is done, as well as our way of life. And in the book, Mark also discusses very timely issues such as artificial intelligence, gene editing, climate change, GMO altered food, and the politicalization of science. As Michaela said, tonight's presentation will be a question and answer format, first between Mark and me, and then he will take questions from our audience via the chat function. So Mark, are you ready? 
Certainly. Really Let's too. get started. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the introduction and also to all the moms there. Happy Mother's Day. Well, Mark, the first question I'm going to preface by saying that virtually every day I read in the papers about a new scientific breakthrough, whether it's robots in the operating room, the solving of cold cases by law enforcement using new methods of genetic marking, or the development of organs for human transplants from pigs and other animals. Yet these and other exciting breakthroughs are really just the tip of the iceberg, the end results of intensive research and development. So we'd love to hear you talk about the backstory and what the current state of science is today. I think in large part you've answered part of the question. Um, Julian Huxley uh, sort of said at some point that science is growing faster and faster. And I think that that's really very true and very important. And it's a nonlinear growth. So we're used to things growing in a straight line, trees growing at a steady rate, flowers, at least during the summer, this growth season growing at a steady rate. When we have something like COVID, which grows at faster than a steady rate, at nearly exponential rates, then our minds have problems dealing with it. And I think that's what's happening with science right now. Science is growing a lot faster. The new techniques that you mentioned, they didn't exist when I went to university. Um, you know, what I'm doing now, I, it was like science fiction to me when I went to university. So I think um, on the one hand, science is growing really, really fast. And um, that's really good. But I think with this fast growth of science also come a few drawbacks. Um, I think science is getting more complicated because it's growing so much. And so people are being intimidated by science, mistrust science. All those headlines you gave, when you read them, are they real? Is this really going to happen? Or is this you know, just an experiment that was done on mice? So, so those are the, some of the things that we, we think of. But I think if we look at COVID, uh, I think every discipline has failed except maybe science. If we think of governance in pretty much every country, except maybe New Zealand, has struggled to deal with COVID, with the medicine, with hospitals, with vaccines. Um, but science has done a good job even before um, vaccines were around, um, medical science in less than a year sort of got this new disease, figured out exactly what was happening and found new ways to treat it. So in the first few months, uh, if you got COVID, the chances of actually being really sick were very, very high uh, and of dying of it. But now, if you get COVID, at least in America and, and in Europe, the treatments are a lot better and, and the death rate has dropped dramatically. And then, of course, with vaccines, we hopefully uh, will be able to, to really solve um, COVID. So I think in, in that way, science is really the status of science is probably never better, been better before. Um, but I think there are also a lot of dangers that come with it. And so um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of those dangers. I'm sure some of the listeners will have some questions about it. So I think the, the state of science on the whole is good, but there is a lot of mistrust. Is science growing too fast? You touch on that at the, in the last chapter of your book that maybe it's, we're the right size now and we're going to get too big or science will get too big. Yeah, so I think one of the things is, um, if we look at the economy, uh, our economy is a growth economy. And so we're always wanting things to grow. And the countries that are the most successful are the ones whose economies are growing. If we go back a few hundred years, that was agriculture. Agriculture was driving the economy. And to be an agricultural superpower, you had to start colonizing. And the Brits and the Dutch and the, were pretty good and the Portuguese were pretty good at this. Then industry was driving the economy. 
and now it's science. So the advantage of science driving the economy is that science is growing so rapidly. Um, so if we look at the big companies that are driving the economy, you know, Google, uh, Apple, Baidu, they're, they're all science and technology co companies. Um, but that comes with, I, I think, a lot of problems. And yeah, in, in the conclusion of the book, I, I write uh, that there's an analogy with humans. Uh, and humans at a certain age, right, once you've reached your teenage years, you've sort of grown enough. And maybe stagnation isn't so bad. Uh, and it's going to be really difficult to slow science down. But, but maybe it always trying to be on the very forefront and breaking every barrier is not that great. I also think of an example of climbing up Mount Everest. Um, for Hillary and Tenzing, it, it was really a big deal. It was earth shattering. But if we now look at what's happened to Everest, where it's really a playground of the rich, uh, and you've got these long, long lines there. Um, you know, do we have to climb Everest just because it's there? So I think science is the same, maybe. This, it's interesting what you say, because of course, with each scientific breakthrough, there's a benefit, but there's also a potential for abuse. And you give many interesting examples of that in your book. Could you talk about one of them with gene editing, for example? Well, with gene editing, I, I think a, a really interesting one was last week. Last week was the first chimera, which is a mixture of, of, of two species. Uh, and what they had done uh, in scripts in, in California is they taken a embryo of a monkey uh, then took human cells, uh, embryonic human cells, genetically modified them with fluorescent proteins, so they glowed green, mm -hmm. and then added them to the monkey embryo and let the mon monkey embryo grow. And now because the human cells were glowing green, you could see that they were actually multiplying within the monkey embryo and were becoming part of the mon monkey embryo. Um, there, laws in the US is that if it's funded by the government, it, it can't go past the point where neurons develop. So after 19 days, uh, they had to destroy their embryos, but they showed that they could do that. And they also showed that if they tried as well as they could to be doing exactly the same thing, um, different cells developed. So the human cells were going to become and differentiate into different parts of this growing embryo. So I think this is an experiment that didn't have to be done with human cells. They could have used monkey with um, mouse, but they chose to do human because they knew this was a big newsworthy event. And so it made a lot of the headlines. So I think there, there are a number of this is not really a dangerous experiment, but there are a number of dangerous experiments like that. Uh, I was at the Stonington Library uh, in 2005 and spoke about uh, my research in green fluorescent proteins. And then I spoke about uh, mosquitoes that are being uh, genetically modified mm -hmm. so that they couldn't reproduce. And there was this company, Oxitec, that was making genetically modified mosquitoes and was going to release them in Key West. And the males would then find females because they only mate with females of their own species. And they were going to release millions and millions of these genetically modified males that were sterile. And they would find females, mate with them, and there would be no offspring and the population would collapse. So it took from 2005 to 21, um, two months ago, they actually have been released in Key West. So it took a long time to go through all the hurdles, but now they are being released in Key West. And, and it's very interesting because it's a scary thought of releasing genetically modified mosquitoes. But on the other hand, um, 
there are thousands and thousands of gallons of pesticides that are used on a weekly basis to prevent dengue carrying Aedes mosquitoes from getting a foothold in Key West. So you're, you've got basically the perfect pesticide <laughs> because these mosquitoes only find their own species. It doesn't kill any other type of mosquito. It doesn't kill butterflies, bees, or anything like that. Uh, and they self-destruct. They're an invasive species. Mm. But yet there's, you know, it's the type of experiment you can never prove that it's not going to have any consequences. Right. Have there been other, I think that's called a gene drive. Is that right, what you're talking about? So, so no, this is an older technique. Oh, okay. So the, the gene drive is very interesting. In a gene drive, what you basically do is um, you can self-describe future generations. In this case, um, the males and the females mate and the eggs hatch, but they're defective. Um, with a gene drive, the eggs will hatch and all the females will die and all the male offspring will carry on having this um, destructive gene. Mm. And so with that, you could foresee that it would spread. Mm. Whereas the technique that this Oxitec mosquito that they have in the Key West, you have to re-release it. So every generation, end of story. Mm. So of course, for the company, it's great because it's more money because every, you need a new load of sterile mosquitoes. Um, but the consequence if something goes wrong isn't that great. So, but yes, the gene drive mosquitoes are, are probably going to be released in um, Mali or Burkina Faso. That's where two of the big American projects are. Well, this leads into the next question. Um, at one time, you thought you might title your book Good Science, Bad Science, Old Science, New Science. Would you give us some examples of new science, including what you term bad science? So new science, I, I think, well, I'll go with the one that I've just been talking about. Um, this year, the Nobel Prize uh, went to Jennifer Doudna and um, Carpentier, two really fantastic women chemists who found a new way of doing gene editing. Mm. So if you think of gene editing 10 years ago, even five years ago, it was very difficult to change the genes, you can think of it as genetic recipes, of, of an organism. And if you wanted to change the gene of a new organism that hadn't been genetically modified, for example, a tick, um, that would take five, 10 years, a couple of grad students cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars. It would be like editing a book with a typewriter. So you, you've got to put in a couple of words, that means you've got to rewrite the whole page and probably maybe the whole chapter till you get to a nice spot. It was very, very difficult. So there was a, this big hoo-ha in the press when we found out what the human genome was. But we had all this information, we didn't quite know what it all was, and we didn't really know how to work with it. CRISPR is like the word processor of molecular biology. With CRISPR, we can go and find a place, we can insert something, we can take something out. So we can go very easily now and start genetically modifying things. So I think that's been a huge major breakthrough. So now if you want to genetically modify a new species that hasn't been genetically modified yet, you go and buy a kit, uh, you type in to the computer what you want the new gene sequence to be like and where it should be, you send it off and $100 later you get by FedEx a little packet with all the CRISPR gene editing materials you need to make that genetic modification. Um, an undergraduate can do it no problem, a couple of weeks most. So it's really made genetic modifications much, much easier. So um, you can do really good things. Um, cystic fibrosis is a disease um, that used to be, have an evolutionary advantage in West Africa, where people who had cystic fibrosis wouldn't get malaria. 
what happens if somebody's bitten by a, a malaria carrying mosquito, uh, the plasmodium that causes the malaria enters the red blood cells and the red blood cells form a shickle, sickle shape and they collapse and they can't carry on. The uh, plasmodium can't breed in these collapsed red blood cells and it doesn't spread. So people who had sickle cell genetic change were healthier and so the population got sickle cell, um, which prevent, protected them from malaria. But today, of course, especially people who've gone from that area come to other parts of the world, they don't need that protection anymore. And it turns out if both your parents have the sickle cell um, mutation, children then get sickle cell anemia in which when they start running or doing exercise, uh, the red blood cells, which are sort of donut shaped, collapse automatically. And so that leads to organ failure, to headaches, to all kinds of things. And so with CRISPR, what they've been able to do is they've been able to take um, the recipe to make fetal hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin that the embryo makes Take so people who have sickle cell anemia take their own fetal the, the, that recipe and put it into the cells that make the red blood cells and then inject that into them. And so when they make new red blood cells, we make re new red blood cells on a regular basis. They will now instead of making adult hemoglobin, they make fetal hemoglobin, which doesn't have this mutation. And, and they st started doing it in uh, trials, medical trials, and it's worked incredibly well. And so the trials are going bigger and bigger. So that's an example of being able to do a genetic modification that's really great. Uh, the problems are there are about 10,000 diseases that are caused by genetic mutations. So um, cystic fibrosis is another one. So the hope is that we could treat them. There are a whole bunch of diseases that call chlorous blindness. They're also going to be treated soon. But there are also another sort of 10,000 mutations um, that don't treat diseases, but can actually make improved people. So with these, medicine can become not a treatment of a disease, but an improvement of your operating system. So uh, there are some genes that could make your bones stronger. And it's just a couple of changes in one gene. And so if somebody's having an in vitro fertilization, um, they can look and see, okay, well, yes, I want my child to have the stronger bones. I want my child um, to have more endurance. Another gene that a lot of marathon runners have this single mutation that makes them um, a lot more um, effective at picking up oxygen with their blood and their hemoglobin. So there are a number of things. So, so CRISPR can be really great, but it can also lead to, to medicine for the rich, um, improving new generations with all the, the moral and ethical components to that. And then I guess the other one that's really interesting. Um, so I'm a computational chemist. I use computers to calculate the structures of molecules. I use um, very complicated mathematics um, that would take me um, 100 years to do. It takes the computer a couple of seconds to do. Um, my calculations um, on computers I have at Khan College take months. Sometimes um, when I want to do really big calculations, I write grants and I have them done uh, at Oak Ridge and the really big computers where I can get a grant for millions of CPU uh, seconds. And then it goes quicker. But even then, all I can calculate is small little changes in these fluorescent proteins. Now with machine learning, this has all changed. Machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. And we've probably heard of it first with chess. So with machine learning, you can actually take a computer and a fairly small computer 
and give it all the rules of chess and say, okay, you go and play with yourself and play a billion games, which will take about five hours. Yeah. And from those billion games, figure out what happened when you won and use those rules to play against a person. And, and the program um, AlphaGo has be, been written and it beat all um, chess players by with handily. It also beat the, the biggest computer, Deep Blue, which was the IB, uh, IBM computer that used to be the big chat test champion. That was a massive computer that made millions of moves and tried to predict everything that was going on. The new genetic algorithms um, don't think and haven't learned from the chess masters. And Gary Kasparov, who used to be the world champion chess player, wrote this long article about saying, when he saw how this played, it, it astounded him. And it was beautiful because the computer used ideas and strategies that he'd never ever seen before, never ever heard of. And they made sense to him, but nobody thought of them. And so from chess, this program went on to beat Go, which is even more complicated. And it was actually the largest watched sports event in the world um, because there was such a large Chinese audience in which the computer beat the world champion Go player. And since then, um, deep learning uh, has really become a main emphasis of Chinese research. And so my research just a year ago was predictably overturned by deep learning, where a deep learning program has now not only been able to calculate the shape of proteins, but actually how proteins fold. Mm. And way better than anything, there are, th there are thousands of people at universities who do the same thing that I do. We all use these classical equations. We use quantum chemistry. Um, the deep learning program taught itself by looking at structures, how things would fold and, and did that. So, so that sort of thinking that a computer can actually teach itself by looking at large amounts of data, and there is a large amount of data about all of us out there, all kinds of things, it, it is a pretty scary thought. Yes when it gets into the hands of the wrong agencies. I mean, it could be facial recognition and things like that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I have another question for you. Um, you just published an article, Six Tips to Detect Fake Science News in the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune. Why did you feel the need to write that article? Well, I think science is becoming so much bigger and so much harder to understand, is it real or not? Um, I, I see these headlines and I never have a clue. And, and basically there are a couple of rules I follow to try and figure out, do I believe it or don't I believe it? Uh, and do I, it's normally not a yes or no. At the end of it, I think I probably believe it or I probably don't. But how do I do that? And so I, I'm, the new project I'm working on right now, it's um, actually done, is a book for young adults. Um, and it's called The Skeptical Scientist's Ways to De Detect Fake Science. And so I, I thought I'd take some of the rules from that book for young adults and put it into rules for adults. And how, how should we try and figure out, you know, especially with COVID, with all these things that are going around there, is this true, is this real? And, and, and how can we do that? What are some examples of fake science? And you also in your book talk about quacks who pretend to practice science, but it isn't really science. Right, so I mean, <laughs> the, the one of the, the ways to try and detect if it's fake science is, is to have a look and see why would people be saying this. Mm. But there are obviously people, a lot of people, quacks, who are, who are trying to sell 
medicines or um, even cosmetics uh, because they want to make profits. Um, some of them, I'm afraid, 90% of America has fallen for, and the rest of the war world is falling for it too. So one of the really big ones is water, drinking water. Uh, it turns out that the majority of the water that we buy in plastic bottles comes from Atlanta, where it comes from a tap. It comes from municipal water. So only if the water that you buy says spring on it, natural spring, then it doesn't come from a tap. So you're actually buying tap water. Um, there's no need to, to, to drink that water. Are you checking to see what water you have there, Pam? Yes, and it doesn't say <laughs> natural spring water. Okay, yes, Poland spring. It says born in Maine. <laughs> I, I don't know if water could be born, but <laughs> yes. Um, but then we also have this thing about drinking so much water. It turns out that we probably drink 20 to 30 times more water than we need a day. Mm. And if you're doing an athlete and you're doing exercise, obviously you need to drink water and you need to be hydrated. And on a hot day, you need to be hydrated. But you shouldn't be drinking all the time. And all the sort of medical studies have shown that, but yet all the big bottling companies like to sell their water. And so somehow we've bought into this. And their Prevagen is my pet peeve. The, the ads we see. And if you look at it very closely, it's actually this protein from the same jellyfish that I work on that they claim gives you better memory. Mm. Um, but proteins are amino acids. And if you eat an amino acid, so if you take their pills, uh, the first thing your stomach will do, it'll absorb it and cut it to little pieces and break it down. It'll never ever get to your brain and go through the blood brain barrier. So the, you know, these pills cost about $40, $50 uh, a, a bottle and they last for about a month. But you know, it's a placebo effect at very best. Mm. So they do nothing. So there, there are a lot of people who have put out fake science to sell something and that's could be monetarily, but it also could be politics. Mm. So we see climate change. Of course, there are a lot of people who don't believe in climate change. There are a lot of people who don't believe in vaccines. Mm. Um, it's very interesting. If you look at Twitter, there was a study that was done to see where does all this anti-vaccine tweets come from? Where does all the rhetoric come from? And it turned out they come from the same IP addresses, which are Russian IP addresses, on both sides of the spectrum. So what they do is they both pro and negative, and all they want to do is create ferment about vaccines. Mm. And, and so, so there, are, there are a number of um, fake sciences that come out there. Really, one of my favorite studies, again, you can do this with a computer now, looked at a million tweets and Facebook posts um, just before COVID came to all the different countries. So before it came to Italy, then before it came to England, before it came to America, and it looked at how many of them are false. And what they found was before COVID came, there was a high percentage of false social media. And that sort of makes sense because we didn't know much about it. But then in some countries, the amount of false and fake um, tweets carried on going up. And in those countries, they really struggled with trying to treat COVID. So the US, Brazil, and the UK are the big ones. Uh, whereas in the countries in which they started putting out a unified scientific message, the amount of social media false science went down, fake science, but so did the number of cases of COVID. So there was sort of a correlation between the two, which was very interesting. Well, when I think of COVID in this country, I mean, the leadership, the message that was coming from, you know, leaders and government was, you know, not always factual it's itself. And so that, of course, didn't help the situation. Yes. Yeah, I mean, 
where the false information came from was a completely different story, yes. Right, yes. Well, I have one more question before we turn it over to the audience. Um, in an early chapter of your book, you discuss the low numbers of black faculty and students, especially women in scientific research and academic positions and in medicine, as well as the lack of undergraduate programs that prepare these and other represented, uh, underrepresented groups for graduate study and science related uh, careers. Would you tell us about the program the undergraduate program that you conceived of and direct now, the Science Leader Program at Connecticut College. I found that a really interesting chapter in the book. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm originally from South Africa, so I come with a huge amount of baggage. <laughs> I grew up in apartheid South Africa. Um, I grew up in the most conservative town in South Africa. So um, the people in the town where I grew up voted to the right of the nationalist governing party. Uh, the Bürgermeister, who was the mayor, rode around on a horse um, with khaki pants and a gun. So, so that's the sort of place I grew up with. Uh, I went to university and at some point um, decided to do some tutoring for Black students in Soweto who were boycotting education um, because they didn't want their classes in Afrikaans. So on Saturdays and Sundays, they would come to the university at Wits where I taught and they would take science and math. And so I started tutoring science and math there. And it's actually the reason I left South Africa because I knew I would have to go to the military during the apartheid times. I came here and started teaching at Connecticut College and started seeing that the students in the bottom 10 part percent of my class were also minorities. And so I started writing some grants, um, trying to figure out how to do it. And I guess most of it was by looking at other programs that worked. And so, so the Science Leaders Program is a cohort program. Um, it, it's just based on the idea if you come as a minority by the very definition of the term, you're a minority, you come, you'll be different to everybody else. If you could come and immediately get to know other people who are like you, who are interested in the same thing, science, and you get to know the faculty at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can build these close bonds with faculty, you know the older science students, you know the other science students who are like you. Um, will that work? And there was research evidence that that would work. And so we also, as faculty, went out to schools in the Bronx and recruited students from those schools to come to Connecticut with this program. And it's been incredibly successful. Mm. Um, the graduation rate, so four years as students, is over 96%. And it's been over 15 years now. We've got medical doctors, we've got PhDs from Yale, from Duke, from all kinds of places. So it's worked really well. It's probably the most gratifying thing that I've done, much more gratifying than any of my research, which is you know, lots of papers that nobody probably reads. Has your program been replicated in other uh, universities and colleges? So that's- We don't know, but- it, it, It's both the sad and the good thing. Mm. So when we started, it, it was a way of attracting students to Connecticut College because we were one of the few people who were doing that. Now it no longer is that attractive because all the other liberal arts colleges started doing similar things. No, not exactly the same thing. So we have, for example, a first year seminar with a first year seminar. We take the students to um, Puerto Rico because I'm interested in things that fluoresce. There's a bio bay in Vieques, we go there. And it's, it's supposedly a field trip, but it's actually a cold building trip. So we have parts like that, but different universities have different ways of doing the same thing. And have they been as successful? I mean, do you see more uh, black women, especially in academic, I mean, in scientific research and uh, teaching? Well, it's, it's like 
I think if you look at white woman in science, um, biology, they, by far the majority in chemistry and biology, but not yet in engineering. Mm -hmm. But as you go further along, you see that it's still male dominated. So if we go and look at you know, people in their 50s and 60s, it's going to take a long time for that to even out. Right. I actually suspect uh, that it's going to more, eat more than even out and that um, in my children's time, there'll be the opposite pr problem. <laughs> um, and it's mainly because we see this at Connecticut College, we can't get the same number of males uh, as females. Um, because they're interested in sports and they're interested in playing video games. And it's, yeah, there's definitely a gender difference. And I sometimes teach on a boat semester at sea. Oh. Semester at sea is 75% female, 25% male, even though they're trying to even it up. And so I think we're going to find that the gender difference is going to look after itself. We still have to do something about it, definitely. I was on semester at sea in 1982. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, on that note, it's time to uh, take questions from our audience. And so, Michaela, I'm going to turn the program over to you. But thank you, Mark. It was really, really an interesting uh, conversation with you. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Mark and Pam. OK, so we do have some questions in the chat. So the first one is from Mia, and this was back when you were talking about the Oxytech mosquitoes. And she was wondering, you may have already touched upon this mark, but just in case, were they already previously released in South America? So Oxytech, the, the Ox, Ox, oh, we've got some feedback. Um, the, they're, made in um, England at first. And so the first tests were done in the Caribbean. And then after the Caribbean, it turns out that Brazil has a huge uh, dengue problem. So there are two factors. Uh, one makes about 10 million of these genetically modified mosquitoes a month. And they actually have this van which plays music uh, in Portuguese, which apparently says, we're releasing the Oxitec mosquitoes, they're completely harmless, come and play with them, and they will wipe out dengue. And so, yeah, they were forced in, in Brazil. And then especially with Zika, when we had the Zika outbreak, it turns out the same mosquito that carries dengue also carries Zika, the Aedes mosquito. So, um, yeah, the, by far the biggest releases have been in uh, South America and a little bit in Vietnam. Thank you. Our next question is from Deidre. Hello, Deidre. Thank you for joining us. She's a, a good friend of mine and the libraries. And she asks, would you ever do gene site? Do you think other countries such as China are using our DNA information for profit? Huh. So, I've done uh, 23 and me which is sort of similar, right? You, you spit in a little tube, they get your DNA information and you can find out. Um, but I'm also all over the web. And so I'm probably a little too careless with my information out there. Um, I'm also turning 60 in, in a month or so. So I, I don't know what they would do with my genetic information. Um, but I, I pretty sure like everything else, there is a really good chance that some company will be using it in an inappropriate way or some hacker will be able to get to it or that there's a chance of that happening. I don't think every company, I certainly don't think so. Um, but I was inquisitive enough to see what the information would say. Um, and so, it's been very boring. I think my, my parents are from Germany and from the Netherlands, and I just don't seem to have any relatives that I don't know about. So I've done it, but yes, I, I do think that, I think maybe the bigger use for it 
doesn't need identity. So we can get these uh, machine learning programs that can go trawling through all this genetic information that everybody has and figure out and find markers for new diseases or to treat something and make money out of that, which might be good, which might be bad. Uh, depends on what sort of markers they're looking for. Uh, but yeah, and then of course we have a whole bunch of forensic uses for that sort of information too. But since I don't have any nefarious plans of wiping out my wife or children or something like that, that'll be okay. Now, our next question um, is, could you speak about how immigration policy affects science? Well, that's a really interesting one right now. There's quite a lot of legislation going through, um, ooh, I can't remember what the act was called. I can't remember. But during the Trump um, administration, there was an attempt to get some legislation to reduce the number of students that come in to America to study. And if we look um, even before COVID, the number of PhD students in the sciences and engineering coming from other countries has steadily been decreasing. Now that's really concerning because if you go and look at the STEM, um, that's chemistry, physics and medicine, uh, Nobel Prizes in the last five years, 30% of those people were born overseas. And they came, studied in America, and then stayed in America. Um, I'm an example of that. I'm certainly not a Nobel laureate or anything close to that. Um, but there are in, in the our chemistry department of six people at Connecticut College, three of them were born outside the US. And that's very, very typical. I did a postdoc at Yale. Um, of the 50 grad students, um, there were probably about 30 of us who were foreign. So um, that, that is a problem. If America wants to carry on being in the front of the scientific research and scientific development, we, we need to get and keep the best researchers. And there's a comment from Mia in the chat, and she says it's not just grad students, but researchers and faculty are being recruited to other centers of academic research excellence, uh, like in China and Singapore. Yeah, so I, I think we see the movement to the in Switzerland, which has crept up in the top five universities in the world because they've been recruiting the top researchers uh, and China and Singapore certainly too, even though they're struggling to, to get a lot of people, but a lot of people have joint appointments, um, which you know, scares a lot of people because does that mean that information is now going to both sides and companies and governments on both sides can be taking that information and using it. So yes, it's not, it's certainly well-established experts as well as um, new thoughts. But I think um, there's also been a lot of science that has shown that all the big breakthroughs in science typically come fairly early on in someone's career. So they, they tend to be by people who are in sort of 10, 15 years after graduation. So the established people no longer really have those. They just push the envelope that's already existing, but they don't find new things. Uh, and I think this is also from Mia. There has also been a reluctance by some to move to the US in the past few years because of the perception of increased xenophobia. I can speak to that personally with difficulties in recruiting senior scientists and with friends leaving the US to take academic positions overseas. Uh, yes, both that and red tape. Well, the sort of strange combination of no rules about some things and increasing red, red tape about others, yeah. We also have, uh, this is a fun question. If you could have one piece of technology from a work of science fiction, what would you choose? So strangely, I read a lot, but I'm not much of a science fiction fan. Um, the time travel, um, my, my son always thought if, when he was younger, 
he'd love to be able to teleport, but I think I'd like to move in, in, in time. I think that would be really cool to see, go back and, and see what the, the younger me was doing at a certain time and what was happening in the world long before now and maybe what, what the world looks like in 10 years or so. I, I think that would be fascinating. There's a um, Matt Haig book, um, I think Midnight Libraries, in which you can change your life, just one little thing in your life and you can sort of see how it changes. Something like that would be really cool. <laughs>